Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video, I'm going to be taking you through the assessment, the treatment, and the home exercise program for an individual who has pain and or mobility restrictions in the atlantal axial or the AA joint. We did the same thing with the atlantal occipital or OA joint in the previous video, so if you want more information on that, go back and check that video out. But here we're going to be talking about the AA joint, and this is the joint between the atlas or C1 right here and the axis C2. And this is the second highest level joint in the cervical spine, the highest being the OA joint. Okay. Now, the atlantal axial joint is a synovial joint of the upper cervical spine, and it has two sets of articulating surfaces. So there are lateral atlantal axial joints. They allow rotation, as do the medial one. And you can see those right here in green. So those are comprised between the lateral masses of the atlas, that is the inferior surfaces, and the axis, that is the superior articular facets down here. So there's two, there's one on each side. But there's also a medial atlantoaxial joint. Of course, it allows rotation as well. And it is between the anterior arch of the atlas, that is its posterior surface, which is right here. It'd be on the other side here, you can't see it. And then you'll notice the axis or C2 has this process that sticks up right here, sticks up vertically. This is called the odontoid process or the dens. And it's going to be the anterior surface of the dens that articulates with the posterior surface of the anterior arch of the atlas. And all three of those joints really comprise the atlantoaxial joint complex. Now for motions, big thing here to know is rotation. 50 degrees of rotation just at the atlantoaxial joint. That's about 60% of the total rotation of the neck. So if you have a patient that comes in that has really significant rotation restrictions, this is a really good joint to check out. It's not just for upper cervical symptoms like cervicogenic headaches, cervicogenic dizziness. Really, any patient with mobility deficits, you really should check this joint out. And we'll talk about the assessment of that in just a minute. Also note that the atlantoaxial joint does facilitate motion in the sagittal and coronal planes, but it's only a little bit. In the sagittal plane, it allows about 10 degrees of flexion, and it actually allows no extension, and it's very limited by the tectorial membrane. Okay? There is a little bit of flexion, though. And then it also allows about 5 degrees of side bending per side. But the main thing we care about here is that rotation. Now, as we continue through the rest of this video, please ignore the obvious continuity errors as we go forward. But in any case, if you want to assess the mobility of the atlantoaxial joint on either side, we need to use what's called the cervical flexion rotation test or the CFR test. This is not to be confused with the cervical rotation lateral flexion test, which is something we'll see in another video. That's used to assess for rib one dysfunction and also for hypomobility of the CT junction where the neck meets the thoracic spine. Okay, so to perform the CFR test, the patient will be positioned in supine, as you see right here. I'm using both my hands to cradle the patient's head. And I'm going to take her neck into maximal cervical flexion, okay? So all the cervical flexion is taken up. And then I'm going to rotate her head to either side while maintaining that cervical flexion. So they're maintaining cervical flexion, that's to the left. That would be assessing left atlantoaxial rotation. We'll assess that for pain and also the degree of mobility. Come back to center and then we'll do the same thing going to the right side. This would be right atlantoaxial rotation. Okay? And then we just set the head back down. Okay? Now this test operates through what's called Friette's third law. Friette had three laws and the third one says more or less, that if you take up all the motion in one plane, remember we have three planes, we got frontal, coronal, and transverse. So when I take up all that motion in the sagittal plane, that's the flexion, it limits the amount of motion in the other planes, particularly for the lower cervical spine. So when I take up all that lower cervical flexion, then the lower cervical spine can no longer, or at least negligibly, contribute to rotation. And so the only rotation that's left 
is of the atlantoaxial joint. So this test gives us about as good of an approximation of atlantoaxial rotation as we're going to get. Now, what is the normal value for this? Well, normal is having at least 42 degrees of atlantoaxial rotation. A questionable result would be anywhere between 29 and 42 degrees. Um, but a positive test can be a number of things. One, it's when you have less than 29 degrees of atlantoaxial rotation on either side. So if you had less than 29 on the left, less than 29 on the right, both sides would be positive and you would mobilize both of them. Even though they're symmetric, they're both limited. Another positive test could be reproduction of the patient's familiar pain. That could be reproduction of a cervicogenic headache or it could be reproduction of neck pain itself and then obvious asymmetry side to side. So for example, if one side had, let's say more than 42 degrees, and the other side was noticeably less, let's say it was less than 29 degrees, that would be a positive test, and you would of course mobilize the hypomobile side. So that brings up the question, how do we mobilize the atlantoaxial joint? Well, one option is to do a cervical manipulation. Now, we've talked about these in other videos, the cervical upglide manipulation, specifically targeting the junction of C1 and C2. You basically perform this the same way as any other upglide manipulation that you usually would do for the lower cervical spine. Uh, but I don't like this option, and I think most people in physical therapy don't either. Uh, number one, it's not necessary. Okay, there are plenty of other good mobilizations that you can use. We're gonna talk about a really good one in just a minute. And there's also that increased risk of cervical arterial dysfunction. Um, if we can avoid manipulating the upper cervical spine, we should, just to minimize what is already a very small risk, but a risk nonetheless. And from personal experience and what I've observed, this other method that we're gonna talk about works much better. So option number two, which tends to work a lot better in clinical practice, is a muscle energy technique or a PNF technique. Same idea, same thing. So for this example, let's assume that she's got a right atlantoaxial rotation restriction. Okay, so left side was normal, right side hypomobile. So the patient's gonna be taken to their end range that you found during mobility testing. So the cervical flexion rotation test. Let's see what that looks like. So there's the flexion and here's the rotation. Oh, it's limited compared to the other side, okay? So from here, the patient is instructed to look left with their eyes. So the eyes, she's gonna to look to the left with both of them. And she's also gonna gently rotate her neck left while the PT, that is me, is gonna isometrically resist. Now this is not a huge amount of force. This might be at most 10% of the maximum force that you can generate for rotation. But if you're mobilizing the right side in this position, she's going to gently rotate her neck left and look left and I'm going to resist. And we're gonna hold that for six seconds. So there she's looking left, and there's the force. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then relax. And then we can move into a little more range. It's amazing how well this works. And then you just repeat this process until there's no further progress or no restriction. Now obviously if it becomes painful, you wanna stop or modify the amount of force that you're using, okay? But you can actually see real in-session advances in atlantoaxial rotation with this method. It's actually quite amazing how well it works. You should give it a try, assuming that you've got a positive CFR test. And again, you always wanna use the test, treat, retest model. So I will repeat the CFR test on both sides before going any further. So at this point, you've tested the mobility of the atlantoaxial joints, you've identified a restriction, treated it in session, now you need to give an HEP for the patient to take home to reinforce what you've done. And one of the most popular ones to reinforce atlantoaxial rotation is this three finger upper cervical rotation exercise. It goes by a lot of different names, but it's the same idea. You're gonna start with three fingers. You don't have to maintain there, can eventually go down to two and eventually one and potentially even none but the idea is you're going to take three fingers to start the bottom finger is going to be on the very top of the manubrium of the sternum okay obviously use patient friendly language and the top finger here is going to be a target for your chin so what i'm going to do is i'm going to engage my cervical retractors do a little chin tuck okay 
And from that chin tuck, I'm going to rotate my head either side. Again, this is operating via Friette's third law. If I take up some of this flexion, when I rotate, it's going to be predominantly AA rotation. Okay, so let's see what this exercise looks like. Three fingers here, one on the jugular notch of the manubrium, chin tuck down to here, and then I'm just going to rotate either side. When I come back to center, I'm going to sweep those fingers other direction. Maybe hold a couple seconds in the ends either direction. and so on and so forth. Once that becomes easier, I can go down to two fingers. It's gonna require a little more flexion. And so on and so forth. And I'll usually have a patient do anywhere from 10 to 15 repetitions per side. And a lot of times in each end position, both right and left, I'll have them hold two seconds per repetition at end range. Um, I obviously went both directions there. If the restriction was just on their right side, you could just have them go right, come back to center. Go right, come back to center. And even if it is a restriction only on one side, I'll still have them go both sides a lot of times just because it's kind of nice to maintain that symmetry and maintain what you got even on the contralateral or unaffected side. So, Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how to assess, treat, and give exercises for restrictions of the atlantoaxial joint. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you so much.